Back in January, just before the one-year anniversary of the January 6th attack, Attorney General Merrick Garland raised eyebrows when he slipped this single line into a half-hour speech. The Justice Department remains committed to holding all January 6th perpetrators at any level accountable under law, whether they were present that day or were otherwise criminally responsible for the assault on our democracy. It remains the most public and direct statement we have from the Justice Department addressing its intentions and the public expectations regarding the federal investigation into the attempt to overthrow the 2020 election. Until that speech, the Department of Justice had been mum on the issue of whether it was investigating anyone besides the rioters themselves. As for the people who planned January 6th, who incited the riot, financed it, ran fake elector schemes in support of it, or pressured election officials and state legislators to overturn Results? We knew nothing. But now we are starting to get a clearer picture of what federal investigators are up to. In a series of scoops since March, the New York Times has reported that the Justice Department had substantially widened its investigation to include Trump and his allies' efforts to obstruct Biden's win, the fake elector scheme, and the financing and planning of the rally that preceded the riot, that one of the planners of that rally is cooperating with the federal investigation and that the federal investigation has brought on a career federal prosecutor specifically to oversee the investigation into efforts to stymie Biden's electoral certification. And then in the middle of election night, last night, the New York Times landed another scoop about the federal investigation. The Times reports that late last month, the Department of Justice asked the House Committee investigating January 6th for transcripts of interviews it has conducted. The House Committee has interviewed nearly a thousand witnesses, including Trump White House officials, and Trump family members. That request was made last month. As for whether the committee will actually turn those transcripts over, it was the chairman of the committee speaking last night. Are you planning on turning it over at some point? Well, once we finish our work, but we're in the midst of our work. See you. Uh, if they want to come and talk, just like we've had other agencies to come and talk, we'd be happy to talk to them. So you're but we can't mm -hmm. give them access to our work product at this point. So you'd be more or less okay with like an in-camera review? If so they said they want to come and look at something, we'd say, come on. But we can't share it. You know, we can't give them, you know, unilateral access. The committee is going to have several public hearings next month to showcase its work product to date. Why wouldn't they be willing to share these transcripts with the Justice Department? And what does the Justice Department asking for these transcripts in the first place tell us about how far along its investigation is? Who better to ask than Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Alabama and professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. Joyce, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, first off, can you help us understand the distinction Chairman Thompson is making here? He would be OK with letting the Justice Department review their transcripts, but he won't just hand them over. How is that different? Why does it matter? This is something that lawyers will be familiar with. He's offering DOJ the opportunity to come and sit in the committee's offices, review documents, take notes on them. But he's saying you can't have physical copies. You can't go back and put them in your computer system and scan through them and, and use them in whatever way you want to. You can use your notes, but you can't have the original documents. So what could a Justice Department investigation use those transcripts for? A lot of different things. It's very interesting. This might be one way to uh, streamline the process of deciding what witnesses you'd like to interview or put in front of the grand jury if you're DOJ. You can look through the notes, decide who has information not on matters that the committee is interested in, but on criminal statutes that DOJ might be investigating. So that's one possibility. I don't think that these transcripts become a substitute for DOJ thoroughly investigating witnesses on its own. It is perhaps an aid. In some cases, DOJ can be obligated to turn over information from witnesses, although not typically when it's in the hands of another branch of government. But lots of good reasons for DOJ to want to take a look at these transcripts. So, Joyce, as you know, I'm one of those people who keep saying, where, oh, where is Merrick Garland? I'm impatient. And the defenders of Merrick Garland often say, well, he can't comment publicly. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So let me ask you this. From the public reporting we have so far, is it possible to tell how far along this DOJ investigation is? Or is that all still a black box? 
I think you can speculate, but to be honest, I think we'll find out how far along DOJ is uh, in its investigations when we wake up one morning to find that indictments have been returned. This isn't really something that you can gauge by knowing that DOJ wants to see these documents. It is suggestive of the fact that DOJ is engaging in a broadly based investigation that fulfills that promise that Merrick Garland made on January 5th, that he didn't care how high up people were, who they were, that if they were involved in January 6th, which I took to mean the entirety of the big lie, that DOJ was heading in to take a look.